there is a rich getting richer effect, and it's 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 sort of like in the post-war era, it's sort of unprecedented, pushing us back to the levels that were observed in the sort of late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. And welcome back to another episode of Amir Approved. Now, before I introduce our amazing guest today, a couple of house cleaning notes. Number one, if you're listening to this on iTunes, please go ahead and leave a review. The more reviews we have, obviously, it helps our rankings. And if you're watching this on YouTube, yes, I'm talking to you guys. Please make sure to subscribe and hit and hit the bell notification button because YouTube does some funky stuff here and there, and you gotta catch our daily uh, alerts of new videos coming out. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you today our amazing guest. Our guest is Joshua Gans, a professor of strategic management and holder of the Jeffrey S. School Chair of Technical Innovations and Entrepreneurship at the Rotman School of Management, University of Toronto. Joshua is also the chief economist of the University of Toronto Creative Destructive Lab. DDL, what's up? You guys do an amazing job. Prior to 2011, he was, uh, he was the Foundation Professor of Management Information Economics at Melbourne Business of School, uh, School of Business. Joshua, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for being on. The reason I invited you is actually twofold. One, I realized you're in Toronto. I'm like, hurrah, <laughs> you're in Toronto. And number two, because of your new book. Yes. Innovation plus Equality. And I love the subtitle here, How to Create a Future That is More Star Trek Than Terminator. Right. I love Star Trek. Yeah. Star Trek is what we're, what we're trying to get to. That's right. I mean, well, uh, yeah, it, 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 or at least in, at least in the uh, incarnation, I sort of remember the most, the next generation, it seemed like. That's yeah, the yeah, good yeah, one. The good the one. The ones afterwards, I'm like, yeah, oh no. We're a bit dystopian. Yeah. They try to make it. No, no, but the next generation, you know, you, you, uh, you have... Uh, uh, technology that can basically solve the economic problem, which is not enough stuff. Uh, you can just make anything you want. Whereas that, there's that famous episode where, I don't know how they bring him back, maybe it was a simulator, but Mark Twain was in it. Oh, right. I don't know. They've got, they've got the holodeck. Yeah, the holodeck. Yeah, yeah. And they're talking about like what happened to capitalism. She's like, well, right. it's been gone for the last like 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was always a Star Trek. I mean, it's, I think we used to call it Star Trek socialism. It's sort of a version of it. I think... I think, uh, and in Next Generation, it was always, you know, that was the, the model, but it was pretty clear that wasn't the case. Actually, I was um, when speaking to a, a famous economist about this, uh, it's like 20, 25 years ago, and I said, oh, well, in Star Trek, they've solved the economic problem. And he said, no, no, they haven't. You know, there is a limited supply of enterprises. There's only one of those. You know, not everybody can have a starship. They're not quite there yet. So he set me straight. He set you straight. Yeah. But there's always competition. It's nature. Right. There's competition and they they had, uh, I mean, obviously these, there were wars, there were different species and other things like that. But from the point of view of what we're trying to achieve with regard to sort of technology and society, it looks pretty good. And so what's the premise? Like, I always ask people why they want to write something. Right. Because A, it takes a lot of your time. B, what's the message you're trying to uh, convey to other readers? Right. So I'd love to kind of take the journey through the reasoning for writing this. Yeah, so it really, so uh, there's a couple of factors. Uh, so I, most of my study uh, that I do is on innovation. Uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, what drives it, what, it's the economics, right? Intellectual property, all that sort of stuff. Um, Andrew Lee, my co-author, uh, was up till about 10 years ago, was an economics professor like myself. And his studies were on inequality and um, education and things like that. And uh, uh, we were sort of talking about that, is that the, no one had come together and sort of talked about these things with a single voice. And one of the reasons why um, I personally wanted to do that was I was getting, well, this is how I often get interested in stuff. I was getting annoyed by what someone was saying. <laughs> and in this case, for me, it was um, Paul Graham. Paul Graham's the founder of Y Combinator. Combinator yeah. Right. And he writes these great essays that are, um, uh, that we give to our students that, you know, uh, they teach you about the startup space and things like that. And a few years ago, he wrote one on, inequality, um, where he was sort of like looking around at his role in the world and looking at the rising inequality and sort of wanting to write something about it. And he basically said, I have a confession or something along those lines. 
I am a manufacturer of inequality. And what he meant was that he was funding startup firms. And when that all worked out, the founders would become billionaires. So he was creating uh, wealth inequality. And so he saw himself as that. And of course, the rest of the essay is. And of course, that's what you have to do. Because how are you going to get people to work or innovate or whatever without being able to reap the rewards of it? And that's a very standard thing. Uh, you know, that's how we think of all investments uh, in one way or another. But it really bothered me. <laughs> and it bothered me. Well, one, one part bothered me is I wasn't sure if he was manufacturing inequality. Mm. One reason why he might not be is that he might be funding these startups like Airbnb, and then that's allowing a lot of other people to earn money. And so, in fact, there may be, well, for want of a better term, trickle down. So it may turn out that he might be making some people rich, but he might be, that doesn't necessarily result in inequality if people, poorer people are, are finding more job opportunities and all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, I had a student look into that. Uh, we're very careful study, and it turns out, yes, he is manufacturing inequality. <laughs> it turns out in uh, California, if you look at the more innovative places and against the less innovative ones and do a, a bunch of things, uh, you can. it's pretty convincing that the more innovative an area is uh, in terms of funding entrepreneurship or founding entrepreneurship, uh, the more inequality there is, and it sort of grows over time with those things. So his confession was correct, uh, which brings us to the thing. Does it have to be that way? Does it have? And when we define inequality, are we talking about social economic inequality? Ah, well, that's always the thing. So, so you know, you know, it's a, it's a debate we don't get into. We're sort of into the inequality if you see it when you see it, obviously mode, in the sense that uh, if you look at the share of income of the top one percent and compare it to the top whatever percent. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and see if that ratio is uh, increasing over time. Uh, that's what we call more inequality. It could be income, it could be wealth. Uh, certainly, social mobility comes into that, but that's an interesting proposition mm -hmm. in of itself. Uh, you know, as an economist, I don't tend to jump up and down at relative comparisons of things. I like like everybody to be better off, and I'm less concerned about where you happen to to be. Uh, but what's been happening over the past uh, 30 years or so is by any of these measures uh, in the United States, Canada, uh, where have you, uh, there is a rich getting richer effect. And it's, it's, it's sort of like in the post-war era, it's sort of unprecedented, pushing us back to levels that were observed in the sort of late 19th century, early 20th century. And so there is this sort of issue going on. Um, and, you know, obviously there are a lot of discussions on how to address that most to do with taxation, more enlightened ones to do with education and, and so on. Uh, but the problem is that every time they get to that, uh, they finally get to that. But of course, we can't have too much redistribution because that will harm innovation. And it's like taken, the right certainly, but even on the left, taken as a given. This Paul Graham proposition that one of the prices we have to pay for innovation is some people have to get rich. Otherwise, the work won't get done, is like a given. And having said, um, you know, with the Creative Instruction Lab, I've seen hundreds of startups come through. And all of them are focused on building businesses that will be sustainable and, and, uh, and uh, are going to be self-funding and so have to do well commercially. But never did they sit there and say, oh, should we be in Canada rather than the US because of rate of taxation? Yeah. <laughs> you know, never were they sort of like thinking about that. Now, I'm, I'm sure if you said you're not going to be able to earn anything and you'll get the same salary you'll get in the end, then we'd have an issue. But what we're really talking about in any debates we're having now over inequality is we're saying, should we uh, change the US into Canada? <laughs> essentially, mm -hmm. because that's the magnitude of the marginal taxation, uh, marginal income tax rates that's being talked about or imputed wealth tax or whatever you want to do, um, or not. And, and that debate rages in the US where they say, if we become Canada, we won't innovate anymore. And it rages in Canada. 
saying we have to re- lower our tax rates, otherwise we can't attract any mm-hmm. of these people. And yet I see all these people coming through and their problems on starting the businesses and building them and scaling them, taxation is not on the list. That's the least of their worries. It's the least of the, and, and, and you can see why is that by taking an idea all the way to wealth, <laughs> mm-hmm. there are all these random events that have to go in your favor to get to that. Oh, end, yeah. Right? The stars have to align. Exactly. And you're going to be focused on getting past the first few of these initially. And so if I say, oh, your taxes are going to be 10% higher at the end of the day, and you're down here, you're saying, that's nothing compared to the variation I'm facing in my income on trying to execute at each mm-hmm. of these different points. Mm-hmm. Um, I got bigger problems <laughs> in getting it in. It's not going to make or break the business. It's going to do anything. And what would that mean anyway? Because by the time I pop out the other end, I'll be one of the richest people in society. So I'm not, you know, so I have to have one Ferrari rather than five, you know, like that's what we're talking about. Um, and so, I've found it surprising they were taking that as a given that, that, oh, but innovation, we have to be careful about innovation when the evidence, well, when the theory for starters was, was suggesting not. And that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. So that's why we have innovation plus equality is that it doesn't seem necessarily at the sort of policies we're talking about yeah. to be a big trade off between them. Uh, there are policies that you can sort of have both, or at least you shouldn't be saying, we want to do this and we've got to worry about innovation or vice versa. Now, if you look though at, um, like you, you look up, you look at philosophies or ideologies, you know, obviously there's a, a bell curve, right? You'll have people on the left and those are outliers. Then you have people on the right and they're outliers, but then you have regular people is like, leave me alone. I just want to have more like buying power. Right. You know what I mean? Like piss off. Are you crazy people? Um, and, and if we look at, for example, uh, let's say entrepreneurship today, or even capitalism in quotes. Like when I view capitalism um, in North America, I don't view it as free market capitalism. Right. You know, for example, let's talk about the Amazon deal. They get this ridiculous tax break. And then me as a little guy, I'm like, well, how do I get in line for this yeah, tax yeah, break, right? Yeah. It's crony capitalism. Right. Right. You get to such a level where you create this monopoly. Right. And you get all these tax... Uh, incentives, where for me as like a fundamental capitalist, where I believe in competition, mm. and I, I like a part in your book you talk about patents, and we'll get to that right, in a right. second. It's a for me, I I, I still got to wrap my cognitive dissonance because I see both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see like, well, I need a moat, like you know. But then it's like I know what happens in patent wars. Right. I've seen it firsthand. Like I understand it. So it's like I'm sitting at two ends. And I'm like, how do we solve this right. conundrum? Because it is a conundrum. Yeah. Um. And so what I like about in your book, you actually, you outline certain, um, I want to say uh, philosophies, but you outline steps that we can take. Right. Um, but let's, let's, let's go to the patents. Um, what's your take on that? So, you know, obviously the patent section is a great example. It's sort of the thing I just talked about, that in order to innovate, you need a reward. That's, yes. the, that's the underlying premise. Um, and of course, that some of that has to be true uh, to some degree because uh, you are taking risks. Um, you know, either if you're becoming an entrepreneur, you could have earned money elsewhere. You could have had a quieter life. If you're supplying capital for innovation, you have to think it's about It's one the of risk the biggest adjustment. risks starting a business, regardless of what you're doing. Absolutely. So there has to be an upside at the end yes. of it. Right. And so one of the, uh, uh, you know, obviously... Uh, if you want to put it in the sort of right way, the government coming and uh, expropriating all your wealth is one problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know if we're talking, as I said, might not be talking about that. The other problem is uh, competitors yes. are coming and expropriating your ideas, right? So, um, you know, you like competition. Uh, when I invent something, the problem is competition takes away what I can appropriate. Mm-hmm. And so we, we naturally have the role for intellectual property protection was to guard against uh, that. That said, <laughs> and, and you can see it, and you can see it, well, if I can't earn anything, why would you? Why would I do it? it? Exactly. And, yeah. and it used to be in the early days of um, CDL, and it's interesting how this has changed. The early days of CDL, people used to come in and say, well, where's your moat? Well, where is my, you're going to have this idea. 
how is it going to pr- protect it? And the, mm-hmm. I used to ask that question too. I come from that same tradition. I sort of asked that question. You know why? Why do you think you are going to make money out of this? What is your, you? What have you got going? Um, and in some cases, it was like, oh, I'm going to get a patent, and we actually know what that means. That that's a still has to be defended and other stuff like that. It's not as secure as yeah, it's not that easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's not bad, but it's not uh, it's not secure. And suddenly, you know, there are companies, the pharmaceutical companies, who have an entire apparatus so that they know how to use the patent system to their, to their favor, but not everybody, entrepreneurs don't have um, And then others would say, oh, look, I'm just going to be good at what I do. I'm going to, my, oh, yeah, I've got this idea. Others might copy it or whatever, but mine will be the best. Mm-hmm. You know, grow another one, you know, whatever. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, what, what, sure. <laughs> what do we know about that, right? Yeah. Um, and I used to be very disparaging of that, but that's actually used to be what people came up with quite a lot. And I think... Um, the where we've come to is that you know there is a, there is something to that argument. There is something to if you are the person who's had that unique insight and has some capabilities to be able to bring that market, and you compare that with some experience from other people who stop you from going down the wrong path for two years or something like that. Just keep focused. Um, you can get ahead of everybody else. Now, that doesn't mean in the future you won't be facing competition. Mm-hmm. You will be, but you'll be one of the players there. And, and I think this is a, one of the blind sides we get from, you know, excessive adherence to it, the importance of the uh, excludability that comes with intellectual property, being able to shut everybody out. I mean, being able to shut everybody out is a great thing. A moat is really good because if you build a moat, which is costly now, then in the future, you can sit in your castle and have a nice, easy life. The alternative is you, you know, trudge up that hill and you know you're going to just have to kick people back uh, for the whole lot. That can still earn you money. <laughs> that can still earn you money. Um, you know, if you look at, um, for many years, Intel and AMD, AMD were, you know, neck and neck with Intel and technical capabilities, but Intel were there but first, they had a brand name, et cetera. And so they were five times as profitable. <laughs> you know, it, it can, you know, you can actually, you can have that situation mm-hmm. occur. And so I think one answer on the intellectual property and patents thing is it's maybe not as necessary as we thought. Uh, it's not a bad thing and it's not. It can it can get you uh, against some of their worst excesses, but it's not necessarily uh, as critical. The flip side of it, though, is it can actually uh, dampen innovation, in the sense that you know you get, invent something, you get a patent uh, on it, and even if it's not the best patent in the world, I'm sitting there thinking I can improve your product. I go to my investors, they say, "Well, this dude has a, a patent." How do we know he's not going to sue you? Yeah. How he's not going to gum it all up, yep, et cetera. Yep. And lo and behold, that's the easy case where it's just one person. What if there's like six yeah. <laughs> things that I'm combining together to do that? Well, then we've got a problem because I now can't come and compete with you, which remember was the point mm-hmm. <laughs> of the patent system. But at the same time, that's not stimulating innovation overall because you've innovated and I could be innovated and everybody ahead of me could be innovating. And so we've sort of dampened that as well. Now, what this basically means is that when you have patents, you don't want them to be too broad. You don't want them to be too vague. You want them to cover what they need to cover to stop sort of naked imitation. Yeah. I don't want people, and, and like trademarks, I don't like it when people come in and rip off a trademark or whatever like that. But, but I don't want people to come in and do literally exactly the same thing, or if it's a pharmaceutical, it's the same compound or what have you. But I don't want them to stop being able to build on this stuff anyway. Um, and so we have to sort of limit the scope of the patent system for that reason. And we have to limit the scope of the copyright system for that same view. Mm-hmm. I mean, half of the stuff here on YouTube, et cetera, I mean, if MIT Press were more annoying, they might say, oh, look, this is here. This is our intellectual property. Uh, <laughs> They've been doing that on YouTube. It's happened. It's oh, happened yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah. That doesn't surprise me. I, I have a textbook. Um, uh, talking about naked 
obscene monopolies. I have a textbook in Australia. Um, it's not my monopoly by choice. I, I don't like that fact, but uh, um, it has a, it ha- uh, is principles of economics, and it was writing about product differentiation. Yeah. And I want to put a can of Coke as the picture in the textbook. Ah, gotcha. So we had to get, get permission. Permission from them. Yeah. Yeah. They said, it's going to cost, cost you, you something. And, and I was like, what are you talking about? I'm putting your freaking Free thing advertising. in the thing yeah. and saying you have a brand. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. And that, no, nah, it's going to cost you. Uh, so we swapped it out to Pepsi. Um, Pepsi, <laughs> Pepsi did it, eh? <laughs> yeah, did you tell no, them no, Coke didn't want no, it? Fine, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so but, but the, 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 fortunately we could do that there. But I mean, it was ridiculous that that was even an issue. Yeah. I mean, sort of taking some of these things and putting them in. Um, but the, 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 the system allowed them to stop that. Um, and I've seen this happen with copyright things before. People just stuff, they do stuff to it. It's, it's one of the things that's made YouTube great. Um, but, you know, someone flags something and all of a sudden the whole thing can be put down. And what that means is the legal system is now uh, using a sort of big slam <laughs> on you, snap down. Whereas what we want is something more nuanced. We mm-hmm. want something more balanced, something, you know, that allows a transactionally easy way of navigating any of these thickets that occur. Um, and so that's... That's basically what we think about with patents, is that innovators are going to be able to innovate more easily the fewer people they have to ask permission from. I agree. And you don't, there's a difference between asking permission and paying a fee. If I hold a patent or a copyright thing and I say, well, you can use my, my Coke picture, it's going to cost you 50 bucks, and I never think about who's doing it. You just send in the 50 bucks and you pay for it, just as mm-hmm. I would any other service. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to get there and you send it in and they're going to say, well, this is a textbook, I might need it. They're going to earn a lot of money. Uh, maybe we should even have a share of the royalty. We're in an in disaster world. Exactly, yeah. I've, all of a sudden have an extra person I have to ask permission from. We don't like when, you know, regulations that require us to go to government and ask permission for a special case and stuff like that. We know that that gums up the system. Same with things that are give private companies that power too. Yeah. It's a general philosophy. You just want, as much as possible, you want innovations to be able to it's occur like what in the Ontario way. government did with the weed industry. I'm like... Well, you know, that's a... Com- yeah, the weed industry is a whole co- <laughs> complicated thing. They, I mean, fumble, ha- they fumbled the ball on that. Yeah, yeah. Completely. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Well, I think... I think I mean, I think there were a, f- a few competing factors. I don't know a huge amount of, uh, about it, but... Um, uh, it's turned into the LCBO. Right. <laughs> and the LCBO is another thing. Oh, this is why it's, it's unusual for, for, you know, I come from Australia to Canada. My, my view on Canada regulation is they, they regulate liquids. Yeah. <laughs> the unusual thing about cannabis is it's not a liquid. <laughs> it's not a liquid, no. So. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that will, you know, well, that gives a platform for another political party to do something different there. I, I'm sure that they could raise more money in tax revenue if they didn't do this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited for the legalization. Hopefully, they don't fumble the ball on this, but the legalization of psychedelic uh, medicine for patients. Oh, okay. That's interesting to me. Um, so going back to this, you know, we mentioned the uh, earning per capita has decreased. I think you, uh, the book says since like 1970s. Yeah, so the, the, yeah, the, um, the, 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 the wage levels of wage earners yeah. have basically been stagnant. But there's, been so- there's a couple of reasons for this, right? We can say, you know, since the advent of birth control, right. women are joining the workforce, so you have now more workers competing right. for the same job. That's one factor. Other factor can be like we had a lot of the so-called blue worker jobs right. exported to other countries. Yes. And so I'm not too sure what the percentage of the workforce right. was that. Um, what, was there something else in the book you guys attribute to the so few, and people talk about automation as well automation. I don't know about auto, I'm, not, I'm not bought in on automation it's, yet. It's, it's, that's harder to, to, to factor so I'm you know I'm not really sure yeah. I mean it is a it is a puzzle but what's really interesting is it's not so much that mm. it's the fact that the productivity of labor has been going up, up. Yeah. Whereas the wages, it used to track nicely the wages and the productivity used to, and that's exactly what we think should happen. But then they've diverged. Productivity is going up. 
the the wage income is not following with it. And, uh, you know, that's a sort of a warning sign. There's something odd going on there. I think the biggest candidate uh, is... Uh, uh, is probably a lack of competition in this uh, case on the labor market. Yeah. Sometimes in the product market, it translates into the labor market as well. Um, and that seems to be a lot of activity of what people are exploring at the moment, trying to get a handle on it. Um, but it's not going to lead to a different policy conclusion. It's going to no. lead to us, the thing we always want to do is have more competition. So <laughs> it's not necessarily a, a new thing at all. Um, there could be some other measurement issues to do with services, although that should that normally used to be a reason why we had sluggish productivity growth, that we couldn't measure services mm-hmm. well. But we've had the d- divergence is going the other way. So I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what's uh, uh, the issues there. I think, you know, from my from my perspective is that um, there are clearly a lot of ways in which we can just. <sighs> There are a lot of obvious policies, more so in the US than here in Canada. Um, there are a few regulations here that are annoying or they put in cartels like we just talked about yeah. and things like that. Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> we can, we can we all can agree. agree on that. We can all agree on yeah. that. I mean, Canada's blessed compared to Australia is that there's a lot of competition from the US that actually yeah. keeps it in check. Um, but then there are regulations that, that add costs. Um, but in the United States, it's a whole other issue. They've sort of like... Uh, uh, they have these this this same disparity going on. Um, they raise uh, less in tax revenue, um, but then again, they take an enormous amount of their you know government spending and spend it on things that are not going to help. <laughs> this is my problem with collecting taxes. Right. So we're still entrusting that. We believe that the government's fiduciary capabilities right. are efficient. Yeah. Where, regardless if I give you a dollar or 10 billion, we as um, prospectors or observers, we clearly are observing right. that fiduciarily you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't matter if I give you a buck right. or a hundred billion dollars, you're mismanaging how the money is right. deployed. Yeah, yeah. You know, like if it was a private sector, it'd be like you're fired. Yeah, well, hopefully. I mean, it was, look, it's hard to say. Look, you know, I, I'm in a university system, so you're not going to have to convince me that, you know, the allocation of funds. Is, I think it needs to just be more transparent. Is a different, I think transparency is one way to do it. I think... Because um, where does our tax... Okay, you pay income, I pay right. business tax, you pay income business tax, yeah. it goes into this black box. yeah, yeah. What happens? I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I pop at the other end. I mean, if I get too many potholes or things like that, you, or if I'm not getting the health care I need or, you know, bridges. Yeah. Of, of, uh, I, you know, I, I sort of like, I, as you drive around Canada, at the very least, uh, compared to driving around the mm-hmm. US or whatever, you can see where that there is money going somewhere. So mm-hmm. even if you're unhappy that like some fraction of it is completely wasted, mm-hmm. You know that Canada uh, collects more tax revenue and public services, whatever they are, are mm-hmm. better than, <laughs> than the yeah, old. Yeah. Um, and you see that, and you see that when you deal with, I don't know if you've ever lived in the US, I was briefly in there. Like when you do things like dealing, for instance, this is the easiest one to get right, dealing with a tax department. In the US, the IRS is this big monolith getting access to it, getting anything done. It's like the, just a tremendously mm-hmm. difficult thing. I've, I've been pleasantly surprised about how easy it is to deal with the CRA. <laughs> you know, if someone contacts you, you can call them back and you can talk someone to, to that Someone to talk to, yeah, yeah. Human to human. It's like a miracle, right, when you think about it. <laughs> I mean, it's like a miracle. I mean, it's, you know, it's still stuff and there's, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's all, all manner of frustrations, but... Well, that's a good start. Mm. <laughs> but but so so you get some of these things, and and you know in the immigration system you get some uh, you know there's some other uh, things that work pretty well here and and stuff like that. But I know it's a big question for the ages how we get that more efficient. Um, you know why it takes two years to build a bridge somewhere, yet if Japan has a sinkhole, the government... The Eglinton re- East to West Line has been taking a decade. <laughs> I know. And they're three years behind schedule. It's, I live there. It's a, it's it's a the most ridiculous thing, thing ever. Well, you know, I, so I always wonder about that. I look at that and I say, oh, why are they taking so long at this line? Because yeah. they're building up the road and they're letting people drive yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, 
Wouldn't it be better if we just said, screw it, Eglinton's out of commission for a month, we're just going to get it all done, <laughs> rip up the road. <laughs> it's, it's partly accommodating. Well, yeah. like, so you, if you see this stuff in Japan, remember they, there's this scene where they, they have some sinkhole occurs. I saw that. And then two days later, it's gone. all done. Yeah. And I'm like, that was possible. <laughs> If that's possible, there's some learning to be had mm -hmm. somewhere on this stuff. Um, um, and I can't mean that they spent a multiple, even if they spent two or three times as much in resources doing that thing compared to the flow on effects and other things and disruption or whatever. Wow. Well, the anyway. city is already getting a lawsuit from the businesses on Eglinton. Right. The city has done this already with the St. Clair West or St. Clair East, the streetcar stuff. Yeah, yeah. They're like years delayed. And you couldn't, you couldn't even drive or get to the small businesses. Right. So the businesses are like, I've, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. And so they have a. It might be I, actually. I, so I do wonder if they could have, if there was a. I, anyway, I don't know enough about this, but I, I, do, I, I we've sat in enough traffic. This is the problem with traffic. Yeah. Is you get you thinking. Get you thinking. <laughs> That's right. You, you all become a, like a Donald Trump expert. Why can't they just nuke this whole thing? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> Get, this Get the job done, done you know? <laughs> exactly. You start to think of these things. And, and, and it is a bit of an issue. It's like it, 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 people start to wonder. Like when you stand in air, airport security line, why can't, why are we doing this? Um, never put people in queues. That's when they start to think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so you, what I like about, I think it was in the, at the end of the book, you guys have two sections over here, but you lay out ideas right. for Improving so both ideas for improving inequality innovation. How about we go through some of them? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so I mean, there's a few. I mean, the, I'm more uh, my expertise is more on the innovation mm -hmm. ones. Um, so, you know, so what we wanted to do is say, look, look, there are, here is a list of ten things that you could do, but don't you don't have to worry about inequality. You can boost innovation and it'll work without having to raise taxes on someone or lower taxes on someone or anything like that. You can just go and do them. Um, so one, we've already talked about the patent system. Yes. You can have that be more sensible. Um, we have one uh, that I like talking about a lot, which is um, uh, different ways of how you can get permissionless innovation going. For instance, uh, with regard to, you know, we currently have uh, one of the monopoly concerns is social media. Yeah. Or platforms in general, right? Um, and we know why, you know, why is there Facebook so big? Because there's a network effect. Yep. Um, and we also know why it's hard to compete with Facebook because you can offer something that was uh, valuable for one particular person or a group of people, mm -hmm. but they're not going to switch to you because they can't convince all their friends and family and connections mm -hmm. to switch as well. And uh, so... Basically, you know, that's a problem. You know, we're going to have a, a monopoly out of that uh, situation. And it's not simply a, an instance of porting your data. What's your data on Facebook? A few posts and stuff. I mean, that's not the issue. Um, it would be an issue if you're on an email operator, mm -hmm. you can move all your data over and we're off to the races. So, what you have to do is you have to get rid of the network effect favoring one entity. And we had this problem before in telecommunications. When we wanted to move away from these monopoly systems, um, we had to have new telecommunications companies in them. We knew an obvious issue. You had to be able to call people between all these networks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the first thing the regulators understood is, okay, we have to have interoperability. Now, of course, the story there was... Uh, they had interoperability, and then, of course, the large networks decided to charge the small networks. Of course, and so you want to amount. use us? All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. And all sorts of matter of, of crap occurred, so it took like a decade or two to wind that around. But, you know, eventually we got to the situation where we've got that. Uh, and suddenly in mobiles, we had a much more level playing field from the start. And, and while mobile... Prices are way too high in Canada. The world. <laughs> and, Canada's top five. Yeah, in the world. no, it's really. And the US too. It's like all these countries that shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Right. Uh, it's like, uh, the, it's great. Russia's the. You want to go. I went to Me and I was, I was Mexico not too long ago. I yeah, like yeah. 100. I think, I think, it, and, and US is about the same as Cuba. I, you know, really? what's going on there? <laughs> it's craziness. Um, so uh, we, we, we got, got some of that. 
we could probably get more. I, I suspect a more activist competition authority and a bit more regulation. So how would interoperability uh, look so, like with, let's say... Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. Okay, yeah. So, so the, the way to think about it in Facebook is what are we really doing on Facebook? Everybody says we're doing something unique, but it's actually not that unique. What you're doing is you're sending a post, and I'm going to relabel that a message, mm -hmm. to one person or a group of people. And the group of people could include the entire world. <laughs> okay? And moreover, you are receiving posts from particular people that you have said, I would like to receive yes. posts from. That's it. It's not happening on a call-to-call -call basis or anything like that, but it's still sending messages back and forth. It just so happens that they're going to more people than than one to one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the the way to solve this problem is if I want to leave Facebook, I've already said that Mr. A, Mr. B, and Mrs. C or whatever can can send me messages, and then I want to leave, and they've said they're happy for me to receive them. I leave Facebook, okay, and they shouldn't see any difference. <laughs> and I'll get their messages and I'll probably see a difference because it won't be in the Facebook algorithm or ads or some other thing. It might be a little slower for all I know, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. But I'll still be able to have those connections. I'll be able to send messages to them. I'll be able to receive messages to them because they've already given permission to receive and send messages from someone with the identity Joshua Gans. Yes. And so long as when I leave Facebook and go to this other thing, it's the same identity, and there's not a lot of reason why it shouldn't couldn't be. Yeah. Um, then what's the difference? Yeah. And so if we and so the, the the term I use for this is identity portability. Facebook have already established an identity for me and a group of connections. Mm -hmm. I should be able to take my identity elsewhere. But do you really think they're going to do that? Well, so that's interesting. So uh, you know, I would th you know you think because they have oh, to open up their API for that. Well, that's right, but. So not without regulation. Yeah. Obviously, they're not going to choose to do that. But Facebook have sort of made noise. They, they already did data portability vo voluntarily. Of course they did. It wasn't going to affect mm -hmm. anything. Um, interoperability is something that they say. Will they do it? That's another matter. Now, they're a bit and maybe legitimately gun shy on it because the, every other time they've done a bit more interoperability, they've ended up with some data bridge in Cambridge Analytica and stuff like that. I mean, the heart of that was allowing people yeah, to do stuff, exactly, right? Yeah. So it's very, it's not surprising that it's trying to lock that down. But, you know, um, uh, uh, that's so, so they, they can legitimately uh, sort of claim that. We wouldn't have got it in telecommunications without a regulation mandating it. We didn't have number portability without a regulation mandating it. Um, we would probably need the same here. Here's what gives me hope. Just a, just a week or so ago, um, three senators in the US proposed something called the Access Act. Okay. And the Access Act mandated data portability and interoperability for social media network. Now, it's like three pages long or something. It's, not, it's like a proof of, uh, it's like a, a call for stuff. So how you'd actually do it and all that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, but, like, let's, let's but it's bipartisan. Ah, so let's, ah, let's yeah, exactly. Let's continue this train of thought. Like, <laughs> let's say there is some regulation where it's like we have to open up the playing field for competition, right? Because at the end of the day, how Facebook makes money, it's no different than Google's ads. Yeah. That's that's right. Um, let's say they do open up, and I, as a competitor, have access. That means the interoperability, therefore, would be the emergence of new social media platforms. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. People would be able to come in and say, you know, I'm going to have one and uh, no Russians allowed. I don't, you know, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is. You, think. Uh, you know, uh, uh, who knows what the point is we don't get to find out because we've got Facebook and Facebook has one set of policies and one set of stuff going on. Um, it doesn't even have interoperability between its own networks, no. really. Like the Instagram is separate. WhatsApp definitely WhatsApp separate. WhatsApp separate, yeah. Um, oh, they destroyed WhatsApp. Well, I, 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 I didn't know it before, so... Oh. <laughs> Um, it, you know, that, that's a whole other issue. Also, their incentives to take over these companies and bring them into their mix would be less if... Uh, well, I don't blame entrepreneurs and investors. Like, imagine you create something and yeah, Facebook yeah. comes around like, well, we're going to give you $2 billion. <laughs> no. Or $19 billion. Yeah, like, no, maybe. no, no, no. Me and my investors don't want the billions <laughs> of dollars. 
please go somewhere else. Yeah, no. Uh, it's well, yeah. Oh, well, it was a Snapchat. Snapchat did that. Um, yeah, but they had a you, they had a plan to go public. They yeah, already yeah. have. You know, it's, it, it's yeah, different. Yeah. You and I are a private company. Right, and right. You raised twenty million. Oh no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you go for it. I mean, no. So that's all fine, and and I don't think there's any antitrust law in the world that would have stopped that, despite what people were saying mm-hmm. about breakups and all that nonsense. That just Microsoft just, value went up after that. Oh yeah. So, well, well, let's be <laughs> let's be very clear. <laughs> You know, Microsoft is the interesting case in point. Microsoft was dragged through the courts. Yeah. There was cause for breakup and then didn't happen, blah, blah, blah. And then for 10 years, they managed themselves the old way, trying to stamp out potential competition. Yeah. And a few years ago, they decided to stop. They stopped doing that and they focused in on the stuff that they were doing. So there's yeah. no expansion into things, that, no mobile. Yeah, yeah. Microsoft are dead without mobile. Nonsense, right? They opened up everything interoperable, blah, blah, blah. It's like, fuel that. And, you know, up until last week, they were the most valuable company in the world. I think they're doing a phenomenal job. I mean, it's just incredible. And, and here's the thing is everybody lists all these tech monopolies. Yeah. We must break up this, this, and this. Microsoft's sitting there. They're the, bigger, the most valuable company in the world. And actually, they're the biggest monopoly. Mm-hmm. They're earning all their money off office, mm-hmm. office and related services, basically. On Slack, yeah. The integration they're going to do now is. Oh, they, they didn't buy Slack. Or they have stake in it. They have a no. Well, they have. Oh, I don't know. They they have their own Teams version of that. But maybe yeah, I don't mm-hmm. know what will, what will happen there. But you know, my, but they've still got. It's just the biggest monopoly as it always was. <laughs> you know, in in terms of the in terms of this thing, except no one's upset about it. And and what it shows you actually, with monopolies. People are upset. If you get a monopoly and you are open to competition, so you can use Google Docs or whatever other things you want to use, and you, can, and you don't mm-hmm. have trouble moving between them, don't get upset as much about it. Even though you know they, they, they're, they're earning money off that, they're earning rents off that, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And my prediction was if Facebook were opened up in this way, the same thing would happen to them. People would say, wouldn't get upset as much anymore. They have a choice. They have an actual choice. They'll stay with Facebook, most likely. Most people will. Some other things will come in. There may be some competition at the fringes. I don't think it would change a huge amount. Yeah. But it would allow that experimentation to occur. It would allow, you know, it wouldn't just be Facebook saying what's going to occur in this industry. Yeah. And I, I, uh, what gives me hope is two things. One is that this bill came up it's bipartisan. That's a good start. Interesting the issue is why it's bipartisan. There's one thing that both the re- left and the right, at least in the US, seem to agree upon. They, they're all happy to beat up on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, the scapegoat. Like, let's go get them. It's like, let's go do that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think breaking them up would be a long, drawn-out thing. Um, I, I think that's just a gambit, mm-hmm. the threat that would tie you all up in this thing. Interoperability is the prize. Um, and, and we could get a lot from that. Um, and that would make Facebook's job easier. Um, if people were, if they, people were happy about their misinformation or that their algorithms aren't good enough or they're too good or whatever it is, yeah, Facebook can say, it's okay. Yeah. Off you go. Try someone else. There's room for people to come in. Doesn't take much to set up. You know, there'll be a dozen small little social networks being created by people. Off you go. And just as uh, Microsoft was able to do with its thing as well. There's a sense in which, you know, competition is good. And it's very hard to get actual competition. I'm not saying you can actually get it. Microsoft clearly, you know, we don't have actual competition. Yeah. But competition can insulate you. <laughs> can insulate you on the political side. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also is being able to have people choose you um, where they don't feel compelled. Uh, just makes people more relaxed about it. Um, these products are not that terrible valuable. Facebook is zero. <laughs> so complaining too much about Facebook is, is a funny thing for people to do. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of think, I wish these companies would lighten up <laughs> on the competition front. Uh, I think to some extent Apple's done that a, a bit. There's bits and pieces of it with, where people get a, uh, are worried about it. But mm-hmm. I think they were for the most part much more open than than they had to be. Uh, and uh, I think Google has done that to some degree as well. 
um, uh, and and got away with it, which is why when people talk about, oh, we should break up Google, they're not quite sure what they're doing. The, the best about, is yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Uh, is sort of like trying to work out what's going on there. YouTube's but, an interesting case study. Yeah. Um, I think it's one of the best acquisitions in history of acquisitions. Yeah. I mean, most of uh, Google's want to be terrible or they've done terrible things to the companies, but YouTube. Yeah. Well, they, they've, part of my French, but they fucked up YouTube in the last like five years. Oh, okay. Like badly, like mismanagement. It's 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 a it's 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 it does seem stodgy. I mean, that's why streaming has gone elsewhere, yeah. right? But um, it's still pretty big. It, oh, it's the biggest <laughs> online, biggest. And I've talked to uh, Eva Lau from Two Fish in the Barrel right. about this uh, in depth uh, in our in our previous podcast. And for me, it's like I find it difficult to see how a competitor in the current landscape can overthrow a YouTube. Very hard. You have the search engine, which is Google, so everything's driven to YouTube. It's right. integrated together with their ML, yeah. machine learning. Uh, you pretty much have every single content creator besides China right. uploading on YouTube. Yeah, uh, They have the only unique monetization. They have multiple monetization. You have ad split, right. which is not great, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. No one else offers that. Even Facebook doesn't offer that. Right, right. You have ways of selling merch directly in there uh, and ways of like streaming and getting tips from yeah. your, your fans. And I'm sitting there as like both a tech entrepreneur right. and uh, inquisitor. And I'm like, talk about a moat. I'm like, I just, yeah. I find it extremely difficult to see how a company can come around and be like, well, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think things can come up in a place. So like the, the case in point is uh, Twitch. Yeah. The Twitch has come through. You know, Twitch... Which YouTube, is Amazon's greatest. Uh, well, the very good acquisition <laughs> for Amazon. Um, but more to the point, just even, even if that hadn't happened, that would have, uh, is that, you know, that should have been YouTube. Yeah. You should, should have captured that thing. But here we had a, a, an initially crappy platform doing, able to do live streaming. Bit of not having to worry about the copyright implications. Yeah. Uh, as well. So that's another thing that comes into it. One of the things that supports YouTube is that the copyright uh requirements you know they're like the state of the art and able to being able to pull down stuff etc cetera, etc cetera. anybody else comes in there if they grow they'll be liable for all this stuff yeah um just as youtube was most of youtube was uh, was dismissed initially as yeah. it's all but like i remember the early days as a wild wild west right like is what the internet meant for the most craziest app scene <laughs> stuff you can possibly yeah, yeah. think about and obviously it's it, more it, it's I don't like saying this, but these days YouTube's more geared towards, I'll say, corporates. Right. It's more and more kicking out individual content creators because yeah, their their yeah. money is ads. Yeah, I think. I mean, it, 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 look, I think the 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 problem is the market is extremely competitive yes. for content creation, and as it is, I I used to, I I was in I started blogging in about two thousand and six, mm -hmm. uh, and but by about two thousand and Nine, I'd built up the sort of largest independent economics blog in Australia. And people used to come to me and say, ah, oh, how much money are you earning? I'm like, money? <laughs> you mean money I got to put on my I pocket? Mean, for I, mean, I looked at, you know, like I pay the yeah. uh, various things. But, but the, uh, and the reason was, is that, is that the ads, you know, just couldn't generate enough money. Yeah. There was no things. We once had a buyout offer at the peak for some stupid reason that I probably should have taken. Um, <laughs> it was like for fifty thousand yeah. dollars or something. It was like crazy. But uh, and I said, oh, but I like doing this. And yeah, I, yeah. You know, like I didn't want to be bothered. Um, but but I think it's just a very competitive market. Uh, I think that YouTube YouTube has a different spaces. You might say it's corporate, but it's still got a lot of the the. Um, it's a huge education platform. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, people uploading stuff that are education materials broadly, mm -hmm. just incredible. And, and, and there's a complete gap in the market is there's no aggregator for that. No. I mean, you have to, you, you still use Google. You search and you hope something is there that will teach you mm -hmm. how to fix something or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but, you know, there's no sort of taking into quality. Um, like I, I can imagine like if you are, if you're just like studying mathematics or something like that, you know, there are people, there's lectures and things like that. You can search for stuff and you might have it explained. There's nothing writing which are the ones the students really liked and all that sort of stuff. 
huge potential. So you're saying we should build a rating system on YouTube. Uh, I think I think some people have had some ideas of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, some you know I, I think there's I think there yeah I I do think it's missing. Um, I don't know what it would look like for sure. I mm. imagine some Reddit type system um, matched to curricula or something. Yeah. Like I don't know, but I, you know, I can find any time I need to do something, I can sort of find a thing. I've, I've repaired my dishwasher several times based on YouTube videos. It's activity. I guess. <laughs> don't need a dishwasher. I'm certainly an expert. I know my way around a toilet. Yeah. Don't need a pumper for that. <laughs> Toilets are covered. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, listen, I, I, I think YouTube has democratized if you have access of internet to right. Like the stuff I learned off of Khan Academy alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On YouTube. It's it's incredible. Amazing. Yeah. Uh so going back to me, I have the I have the actual ten ideas for boosting innovation. So which other one takes your fancy? Yeah. So intellectual property we talked right. about. Um this one is interesting. The grants. Yes. Why don't we touch base on that? Oh, okay. Yeah. So let me just sort of remind myself. Oh yes. Yeah. So you know, it's like so. Yeah, grants are interesting, right? Yes, especially here in Canada. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, so, I mean, there are some obvious things that we don't want grants to do. Yes. We don't want grants to directly fund things that will otherwise be done. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a very it's like, hard Really? Principle. You don't say? But every time, so, so there is a thing, and this is where, you know, uh, you know, while I'm coming from the left side, I'll agree with your libertarian instincts on the political process. When it comes to funding innovation, the political process demands wins too early. And so what you have is you have politicians, and they want to fund stuff, but they also need to have during the time of their, during their election cycle, mm. a win from it. Yes. Well, what are you going to do? If you want to win, you don't want to take a risk. No. You want to, for instance, fund something that already looks like it's a success. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to fund something that isn't a a uh, isn't going to look like it was a big failure. But we know that with regard to innovation or innovation of things, that's not what you want. Like, so there was always this discussion in the U.S. where they funded some solar company and then lost a whole lot of money on it, mm -hmm. whatever, because solar was uh, is difficult when it gets picked up. And of course, the punishment for losing all that money was huge political things. And I'm not saying that, you know, there should have been no punishment for failure, but you have to understand that it's just like, if you are going to do things innovative, you're going to have failures. So, you know, uh, one thing we've done at CDL recently is we opened up a space stream. A space stream, okay. Space stream. It's led by uh, Chris Hatfield. Okay, yeah. Why not? Why not? Of course. <laughs> well, it's, it's not actually just that he's a public figure. Um, uh, he, there is something about somebody who has commanded the International Space Station that makes them a very clear thinker mm. of what to do. They know the decisiveness, the questions There's no room to ask. for mistake. None. It's no tolerance. Yeah. It's quite impressive. But he also has domain expertise <laughs> in this area. Canada doesn't have a space program. We don't anymore at all. No, no none of those really? sorts of things. It's nothing like geographically we're not in the right place in the world yeah. to launch rockets. Why set up a space program in Canada? Well, one is because we were CDL and no one else was doing it. But two is that it's, it's a thesis. All of a sudden, we've had, thanks to SpaceX and other things, a massive drop occurring in the uh, cost of accessing space. Well, I mean, Astronomically. And dropped. it's going to keep, yes. keep going down to, to some huge degree. And so now, and now we're not there yet, but now we're, we are, if we continue on that trajectory, we'll be at a point where there will be the ability for people to think of a business that requires access to space and do it. Mm. And that's what the space stream is. Now, here's the difficult part about that is half these things are like, if you do a thought experiment and say, if I had very cheap access to space, what could I do? And think of lots of ideas that are almost no-brainers. 
The problem is, is that rate of decrease. Yes. We still don't know what it yes. is. We don't know what the access is. We don't know what the, you know, all sorts of stuff could happen in the meantime. You know, we're one SpaceX crash <laughs> away yeah, totally, from yeah. things slowing down, et cetera. Um, so it's very, very risky. Um, but we open that up because the idea is like you have to sort of start at some point. And the expectation is that most of these companies will be failing. Mm. And they'll be failing for things like timing issues, uh, as much as execution and other things we want to lump it in together. Yet, imagine if, and, and so it's going to be hard to get capital for those startups. Yeah. We're already off to the races. Yeah. Hard to get capital for those startups for good, solid reasons. Yeah. However, Let's imagine that the government decided to put up capital for that and said, we're going to have space expertise mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. It's going to benefit we, you know, a country with very long, remote areas and other things like that. So just on a global scale, that's good. Uh, people, when they talk about going to the moon and the asteroid belt, what are they talking about? Mining. Yes. Uh, mining. That seems familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have expertise there as well. And so you can see that you could align some stuff. You could have a vision, but it can't be a vision that says we're going to have stuff in orbit, we're going to have stuff on the moon, blah, blah, blah. This is where I agree with you where government funding does benefit. Yeah. Because no private individual is just going to give $100 million. You can't. you can't. And most of these big innovations that sort of push things along, there's been some sort of government seeding, yeah. sometimes by accident. But, so, you know, like something spitting out of a Department of Defense or whatever. Bits I, of the yeah, I and, think it's good to have, yeah. you, you come to a point where at least r and D's done, then it can go to commercialization. Right, right. But also, I've thought about this before. I don't know if anyone's done it. Maybe Canada can be the first where it's like, will you CDL space program, for example? Yeah. Um, you know, Ontario just had a $100 million tech uh, cluster fund. Let's say we have a $100 million space right, program right. fund goes into here. And then we're tracking, it's a think tank. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's bring in the brains. Yeah. We're going to make stuff. Okay. The money that the government gave us comes from taxpayers. Right. Directly. Yes. Right. Businesses and income tax, wherever the streams. But anyways, right. it's tax dollars to this fund. This is where I see an opportunity of, you, you're familiar with UBI. I know you, uh, yeah, 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 universal basic income. So my buddy Floyd, he's leading like UBI, UBI right, works right. in Toronto. Um, I've always said, okay. I'm a firm believer in a UBI dividend fund as opposed to just like... Right, right. And this so, is like they have in Alaska and in Norway. And yeah, exactly, right? Or Kuwait with the oil funds yeah. for everybody. Where let's say the space program with the $100 million goes and we discover something. Right. Uh, it's government funded. We start using it. makes a profit. Right. Theoretically, us as a taxpayer yeah. should get some dividend from that. It's it's a way to do it. I mean, like, like it's. It, I, I don't the know how it'll align in, in that way. No, they're great. I mean, obviously, with mining. So this is where we sort of have historical problems. Is that it's, it's in mining? You know, most of the stuff. There's think about what what it takes to get rich from a mine. Um, you have to discover something. Mm -hmm. uh, you then have to pull it out and sell it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But the fact that it's there already is an endowment from the land. So if I give you just randomly allocated mining rights over a certain thing, yes. that's like a gift to you. Yes. Yes, you have to do some work still to get it out there. And we want you to do work, so you should have some upside. Mm -hmm. But you shouldn't necessarily get the whole friggin' lot. Um, uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, Australia actually decided to pass a resource rent tax, basically okay. to tax mining. Basic and then distribute it. Mm -hmm. That was a way of getting income. Um, and of course, the mining companies push massively back. Yeah, with the you know, lobbyists. The funding yeah. and the yeah. things like that. But it's the kind of thing that we have in mind. In other words, if something is there and it's obviously pure luck, we should have a stake in it. But the same is on these moonshots. I agree with you. Now, how you do it, because you've got to be careful. Um, you don't want to stifle the extra innovation that needs to occur. Mm -hmm. So you have to find some way of measuring with mining, it's easy to work out a way. It's like, uh, you know, you, you, there's enough certainty there where you can do the calculations and work it out. With space would be a little bit harder, but not impossible. It's not impossible. There would be ways of which 
you could set up a sort of corporation or an entity that could hold. It could be no different stuff. than you and I doing a startup and we hold 10% equity for employees. Yeah, yeah. So we have 10% equity of whatever, 90% right. you can do whatever. I'm already, the reason you even exist, because right. I'm putting my labor in X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm paying tax from this random labor. Right. And the only reason you have this is because of my labor. Yeah. Right. It's a different story when it's privately yeah, funded. Yeah. Do whatever the hell you want. I don't care. Right, right, you right. Know, go spend it all, burn it all. Yeah, I don't no, exactly. care. Make a trillion dollars. But if you're going to have a government seat, and this happens with other things like uh, you might be quantum computing mm-hmm, or some of mm-hmm. these other things that are long payoffs uh, that might be required, there may be entities that way. Uh, there's, a, yeah, I admit there's attractiveness to it. The only thing is you don't want to stuff that up. No. Because, again, you've got this other side. You've got the permissionless innovation. Yes. For instance, Creative Destruction Lab, you know, for all of its success, it's kind of unique in another way. Um, well, we don't put money in, uh, although we have some streams that, that have some money available, but it's private. Um, um, and people sort of talk about, well, we've got costs. Shouldn't we be raising it? Shouldn't it? And so people, uh, you know, whenever we think about funding the costs of a thing like CDL, people come and say, Oh, well, you should be taking a stake in these companies. That's how you should, should get around mm-hmm. this. And I, I look at that and I, I, and Y Combinator does that and stuff yeah, like 7% that. Yeah, 7% or something they, like that, yeah. And they, do, they do stuff and they, you know, people make that trade off. Um, but I, I look at us doing it and I'm like, then when we're getting people who are applying for it, they've got to sit there in the calculation in their mind. Yes. They're going to be. We're going to be sitting on their friggin' cap table yes. forever. Yes. So, the difference between that and a mining royalty, a mining royalty is not like it's a share of corporation. A mining royalty is a if you pull this ton of ore out, you pay this amount. Yes. If we could work out the same thing, uh, the same measurable, planable instrument, uh, then it becomes like the. Uh, it's still permissionless, but I know what the cost is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's what you kind of want to come up with. I don't know what the solution would be for space. I don't think we're at that yet. And I don't think anyone's proposing putting in the Canadian Space Agency or whatever it's going to be yet. It'd be nice if they did, but <laughs> we could think about that. But yeah, but that's so we have to think of something measurable. So you don't want to have something, you don't want to harm permission. You don't want to, you don't want to create a problem. Yes. And cap table mess ups, startups are. It's 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 a costly piece of crap yeah. that these founders. I had. Um, it's not my idea. It's been done before. I think some areas in New York. Um, oh, was his name? I forget his name. One of the original angel investors in the states. Anyways, it's um, how do we stimulate more? Because when people talk about startups, they talk about the, for example, the fan companies, right? Right, or they look at the Silicon Valley companies. I tell people that's a zero point zero one percent. Yeah. <laughs> They're the outliers of outliers, right. right? You look at the medium of a successful entrepreneur, uh, a male, this is a stats, male, mid 40s, right. $3 million to $10 million. Yes. That's the normal right. entrepreneur. Or hopeful, normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, maybe as a team of 15, 20, <laughs> you know? Okay. Um, so we look at Toronto, then we look at, and this can be applied anywhere actually, and we look at surrounding cities in Ontario. What would be interesting is having a grant-like system, and this is goes to what Amazon got. So I'm kind of repeating what Amazon, right. but for like me starting off. Yeah, yeah. Like, can you give me tax-free or maybe like rent-free or something of incentive right. to have a my operations here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm starting out. I'm whole, I'm hiring local. I'm getting people here. I'm I'm not right, a right. I'm not an Amazon. I'm right. not a Google. So they do do those sorts of things. They mm-hmm. have those sorts of things available. Um, they're often contingent on hiring enough people and stuff like that, to trying to create jobs. Um. Uh. So so that does exist. I think there's a tendency to focus on that as the sort of constraint. I I don't know if space and other things, rent and other things are the real constraints. I think that's just like this. There are options around. Yeah. I, you know, for us it was, the constraint was um, the bigger thing that was, uh, you know, what Silicon Valley had that that Toronto didn't have was people around who are able to provide. The network. Advice. Yeah. Yeah, It's not just a network. It's like just being able to, it's experience and expertise. And so, you know, if you have a place like Canada that hasn't had as many startups go to scale, that means yeah. there are fewer entrepreneurs. Totally. And, blah, 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 blah. and so you want to make sure you can sort of attract that. And so the miracle of what CDL currently has, it's 
it's like an ecosystem in a room. Brings together all these people every two months. I've been to a couple of them. They're fantastic. And, 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 but that, it, it, in terms of, remember I said, that, you know, the, between idea and getting some money to it, there are all these steps. Mm-hmm. The more you can push down and de-risk yes. each one, the better it is. Much better than a break off the rent. Yeah. <laughs> much more valuable. You know, if I can save you three years of mucking around, that's much oh, yeah. more valuable Hands than down. any tax Hands break on rent yeah. that I could give. And so I think those sorts of things are, uh, uh, are what we want to encourage. I mean, I, I think, you know, what has surprised us is like when we started out CDL, it was like, I think the first cohort was 20 companies. Okay. And people thought, whoa, 20 companies, That's you know, how are you going to do that? And now we're up to hundreds a year. Where the hell did they all come from? The answer was they were always there. Always there, yeah. They were just latent. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I don't think it's just a Toronto thing because we've been popping these all over. We've got in Halifax, this, they, 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 I heard they're in great, awesome like stuff over 25 there. 25 companies a year in Halifax. Yeah. It's a small place. That's a small place, but it has some, uh, entrepreneurs there and has some others who have stayed there. And Calgary is the same thing happening. And imagine just forget just Canada just popped around the world. Mm. How many of those sorts of things are? So. Uh, the challenge is trying to bow, the challenge is not to create a Silicon Valley. The challenge is to to get that same ingredients unlocked in all the places. Yes. Now the thing with like Silicon Valley for me is, you know, um, you look at like the venture capitalist model. The model is very simple. It's like we double down, we want unicorns, right. so we want asymmetrical returns. Yeah. Right. We want a thousand percent returns. Yes. We look at the, the statistics right now, less and less companies are going public. Right. We look at, for example, oh, what's that big fund? Um, SoftBank. SoftBank. <laughs> so they're going to outcompete me by just ridiculously valuating startups. Here's a hundred million dollars. Right, right. Like we work fiasco. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, it's like, I kind of, I personally see the running on the wall. Right, like right. To me, it was like a pretty much a Ponzi scheme when I first got a long time to the VC. I'm like, wait a second. Like, why is your company worth thirty million dollars? Yeah, yeah, am yeah. I am I like the schmuck in the room? Am I missing some data points? Like, you have zero profit, right? Am I is this like reverse entrepreneurship? <laughs> Profits don't matter, you know. So I kind of see the writing on the wall yeah, yeah. with this type of. I mean, it's. It, I mean, people. I, I don't know whether there's a bubble in this stuff. What it seems to me, there's a few things. One is I think, and it's related to inequality. You know, there are a lot of extremely wealthy people. Mm. So there's a lot of stuff sloshing about. And that's where they end up in the soft banks and the <laughs> in these firms. Like we'll allocate some of our capital to these more well, highly risk stuff. Um, so I think that's going to fuel stuff. Yeah. Now, the part of that's good. I mean, you shouldn't want to then throw it away and, and things like that. I mean, I... I, I, I want to throw it away like, okay, so I, I'm not going to name names. They do their job. Some do great, some do poorly. Um, you look at, for example, companies go public. At that point, all the value has kind of been extracted by yeah. the time it hits, whether it's an RTO or an right. IPO. Right. And uh, let's say retail investors, hopefully they eliminate the accredited investor. That whole thing is another way of creating inequality. Right, although you've got to be careful because the, the rationale for that is that people... Um, it's but they can seed go, funding and but they and can the, go gamble. It's gambling, but they can go. The beautiful thing about gambling: one is it's regulated, yeah, to some degree, um, and two is at least you know the odds. <laughs> I'm not saying anybody gambles and necessarily yeah. knows all the time, but this other stuff is gambling. I mean, and we had this problem with cryptocurrency, yeah, as well. with, uh, and uh, so you've got to be a little bit careful. Well, about they that. have like the Jobs Act where you can do up to twenty five k. Right, just right. kind of erroneous paperwork. I think if they streamline that a little yeah. bit better. I mean, we've got these funds like AngelList and other things like that. I mean, we could open it up yeah. to people. So what I'm trying to get at though is, let's say you and I have a startup, we raise five million Series A, right. We're doing okay. We're not profitable. Uh, we raise a Series B, and uh, we're profitable. Whatever the margin is, I think having an option of going faster, uh, something something similar to even how uh, Spotify did the sideways right. IPO, like price discovery, but more or less, um, 
like I said, before they went public, the value was extracted. Right. How can we, and when I'm looking at the stats, because less and less companies are opening up the books, the valuations are ridiculous. It's yeah, like, yeah. oh, we're valued $100 billion privately. So you have to be valued almost a trillion dollars what to go public. You know what right, I mean? It's crazy. Uh, so, how, uh, and this is where like security tokens are interesting in the future, not currently right now. Right. It's way, way, way too early. But how do we create systems where we can get more companies whether it's a new system like an STO or, right. or a new type of IPO model where we can get earlier access to retail investors. Yeah, I don't, you know, that's a, that's far. So look, look, let me just give you my impression. Mm -hmm. My impression is that if you have sort of passed the master of the quality process that, that we see it at CDL, um, which is just basically nine months of intense performance. Yeah, kamikaze goal. Yeah. yeah. Um, you are, and you come out of that with a, a solid, you know, looks like a stable business model. The idea mm -hmm. seems to be proven, et cetera. You can, you can raise those funds. It used to be the case in Canada. It was like really hard. Yeah, now, yeah. It's getting now with that yeah, network, it's yeah, getting totally. easier. So you can do that. The ones that don't raise, it's usually a signal that they shouldn't be raising. <laughs> yeah. They can't get the ones. So I, I can't. I don't see the constraint to the retail thing as the as the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the the problem is getting the companies up to speed uh, so that they are investable. Uh, investable, um, and I think that's a you know that's a huge challenge. And certainly a challenge with the companies we have that are very science based. That sometimes it's like a four-year time horizon by the time you get regulatory approval for something or whatever it is. Uh, but, you know, uh, there seems to be there seems to be a bit more patience for that now. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if we need to unlock more funds necessarily, um, you know, for, for that funding. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm not wrong, but that's the impression I get. Yeah, like I, I, I'm going perspective as... Um, there's a lot of really good small SMBs and lifestyle businesses in Canada right, globally, right. not just Canada. These aren't the unicorns. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. really good cash flow businesses. Right, extremely well. And a lot of people use the products on a day to day basis. Yes. Um, this is just behind closed doors talking with these people using the products. If the opportunity did arise, they would take a position right. for the upside. Right. It would help. The incentives align. Nice. So you think? Oh no! Okay. So I mean that you, that may be true. I I haven't seen that. I haven't. I don't get to see that. So 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 that might be true. There may be this sort of unlocked things that could scale, but we haven't. You know that it just the opportunity isn't there. The match isn't there. Or you know people are happy doing what they're ha doing, and no one's taking it to the next level. That could well be. Yeah, because. You know, whenever everyone, everyone talks about startup, they talk about unicorns. Right. I'll put that aside in that basket. Um, there's, but let me let me just say, yeah, that what retail retail investors aren't going to get you the answer to that, and the reason is because the other thing you get from the right sort of investors is it comes with that boatload of advice. Yeah, yeah it comes with the network knowledge. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah totally. and, I mean, you know, retail I don't know. Do they? You know, do they? It doesn't have that. Not like the reason why I bring this up is there is a massive long tail of amazing businesses that'll do like a couple of million dollars to ten million. Right. Massive long tail. <laughs> um, and you have you have entrepreneurs where the premiums aren't that sexy of these businesses. Right. Maybe two X. Yeah. So they ponder, wait, should I sell my business for two X? But then where am I going to get cash flow of this business anywhere else? Yeah, yeah I'm not yeah. going to sell it for 2x. Right, right. The premium's too low. Yeah. It's not in a sexy industry. Right, no one's right. going to give me my 10x, whatever. Right? Okay. right. So it's like, I'm not really getting a payday as yeah, an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. I might be taking like 150k dividend for the rest of my life. But, but that's what we get from moving all this out of Silicon Valley. Yeah. The things that are the unsexy businesses, pretty darn interesting. And that's uh, that's another thing that we like to see. Mm -hmm. I like to see these ones, uh, uh, you know, that look like they are. Well, you know, 
it used to be said to have come up and said, oh, well, that's a loser category, and that used to be it. But now people are getting more open to that. Yes. Because it was a loser category, because everybody's saying it's a loser category, so yeah. it got going. Uh, but people are working out how to make the case. Now, if you, can, if you can prove where the money is, there's that. And so I think moving out of the mindset of geogra- geographies and across different countries would hopefully do that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Is there any uh, last works. final things that we should kind of talk about to uh, for, to get across to people? Um, I don't know. I, you know, like we've been pretty far, far yeah. ranging, so it's been pretty good. Uh, I I uh, I'd love people to read the book. <laughs> Please do. It's a fantastic book. Uh, I'd like policymakers to read the book as well. Yeah, uh, it's a light read, which is great. Yeah, it's it's yeah, organized yeah. beautifully. Like I had. I went through it last night. It's fantastic. It's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, uh, yeah. No. No. I think I. I think we've covered it all. Uh, you know, covered stuff. There's. There's other things we can. You. Can, there's each bit of there could be drilled down for some period of time. We didn't even talk about you know the downside of technology and all of that sort of stuff. Also sitting there in the book and how to think about that. So that'll be part two. <laughs> <laughs> a future time. We do That's worry right. about that quite a bit. So yeah. Cool. Well, Joshua, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, guys, please go check out the book, buy it. I'll leave a link below in the show notes. Joshua, once again, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Wish you all the best. 